the YouTube page where we're streaming this live and you can hear us that way, or is there be too much of a delay? This is Geek Gab with your host, Daddy Warpig. We are back. That's right, Daddy Warpig, Dornall, and Brian Nehemiah back again for another episode of Geek Horrific Gab Fest. I want to welcome, welcome, welcome all of the uh, people, no doubt, waiting for us to get on the road. We are, oh, we're only eight minutes late, which, given the difficulties that have been placed in our path today, is practically miraculous. We have literally on the phone, and I'll explain that literally in mere moments, we have literally on the phone Larry Korea. Monster Hunter 45, the international lord of hate, author of the Grim Noir series, author of Monster Hunter International, author of Dead Six and Swords of Exodus, which, by the way, there's actually a proper name for that series, but I don't know it. How bad of a fan am I? And also author of a top-secret fantasy series, Starting in October from, of course, Bayon Books. I'm going to stop talking now and let Larry say hi. Hey, everybody. For those of you, <laughs> let me tell you how this is going to work. I, by the way, we do this through Google Plus Hangouts. And we do this through Google on the Air uh, through uh, YouTube. And just two days ago, I tested out the capability of calling out to someone's phone and inviting them into the Hangout so Larry could join us. And, of course, today, when we get the show set up and running, it won't let me make a call. I rush, rush, rush to research the issue, and I find dozens of blogs that are happy to assure me that I am fully capable of making this call now, thanks to Google adding this capability, but none of them tell me how. It's the benefit of blogging that you can tell people that something awesome is available, but I don't actually tell them how they can get this awesome, awesome thing. So what I am doing, I have my mic sitting here by the computer, and I am literally holding up my iPhone in my right hand so Larry can talk into the mic. It, unfortunately, it means he can't hear anything else but me, which is a grave a grave discourtesy to a celebrity guest to force him to listen to only me for an entire hour. But that is what we have to do. Um, Doran and all, Brian are going to be talking into my ear, and then I will ask Larry the question. So, folks, you're going to hear every question twice. You're just going to have to get used to it. Apologies. Um, apologies for this. This is... I, that's I'm right, so ladies and gentle geeks. It is 2015. Welcome to the show. This <laughs> is the future. This isn't too bad, really. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna get right down to it because uh, I'm tired of complaining and I'm tired of being angry at Google and Skype. I want to talk about fun stuff. That's what this show is. I'll play, no work, one hour of coolness just to cool you down from last week, get you ready for next week. I'm going to stop for a minute and the way I should have done and let my co-hosts take a shot to say hi. So, Brian, uh, Dornall, please say hi to the folks while I rest my wrist and switch to my left hand. <laughs> Hello. Hey, guys. Hey, everybody. Hey, Brian. I, uh, what's with the hand switching? I mean, if, I figured after years of internet use, you should uh, be able to do many tasks with just one hand and switch as necessary. I oh, that that is <laughs> that is uncalled for. I I got that same joke this week from the wife of a celebrity. So <laughs> I don't need to take that from you, Mister. All right, let's uh, let's jump to Larry because I'm sure more people are here to to hear him than to hear us. Um, Okay, the, when we first spoke about coming on the show, uh, one of the things you mentioned was sad puppies. Um, and I know that Brian is registered and ready to nominate and vote. I am registered and ready to nominate and vote. But for the members of the audience who uh, 
may not know what Sad Puppies is, go ahead and and go ahead and let them know, um, and also where they can get involved. Sure. Um, Sad Puppies started uh, two years ago, and uh, the, the big prestigious award in science fiction and fantasy publishing is the Hugo Award. And um, some of us have just decided that over a recent decade that they've become more and more irrelevant because they've kind of all been taken over by social justice crusaders, kind of had a voting block, and so they made everything super political, and you had to tell the party line. And so I, I looked at that, and I got nominated for an award a few years ago, and I pointed out that, uh, you know, because of my politics, I was doomed, and people were very, very biased. And, you know, they called me a liar, so I said, okay, I'll prove it. And so what I did is uh, Sad Puppies was a concentrated effort to uh, get people who want social justice types to nominate books because I wanted to show the world that when, you know, people who weren't part of their group got nominated, they'd have a complete freak out. So I did, and they did exactly as I predicted, and it was hilarious. And uh, so uh, Sad Puppies, uh, the, the name comes from the fact that the leading cause of puppy-related sadness is pretentious message fic literature taking over sci-fi. <laughs> and, uh, and we had a lot of fun with it. We were silly, and, you know, my spokesman for the campaign was a manatee. Uh, we had a series of cartoons and videos of sad puppies crying. <laughs> you know, it was, it was really goofy, but it was a big success. We got a bunch of things nominated that normally wouldn't. The other side got outraged. It uh, uh, wound up getting reported in the Wall Street Journal and USA Today. I mean, they threw that much of a kid's bit about it. And then uh, we're doing it again this year. And so if anybody wants to participate, anyone can vote or anyone can nominate and vote for the Hugo Awards. All you have to do is register with uh, the WorldCoin. And there is information on how to do that on my blog. Uh, and there is information on Brad Torkerson's blog. He's kind of the guy that's the standard bearer for the campaign this year. So, um, those of you listening, I'm, I'm sure some of you are uh, fans of Larry that came here because uh, he announced it and I announced it in a couple of places. Some of you are involved, uh, no doubt, in the ongoing controversy that shall not uh, be named because uh, the show is all about fun, not about the controversy. But if you want to be involved in either embarrassing or infuriating social justice warriors who have had a a grip, a, a, a uh, iron grip on science fiction and fantasy publishing for a good decade and a half or two decades now, get involved uh, in nominating for the Hugos, get involved in voting for the Hugos. If you want a supporting membership in Sasquan, which is the convention in Spokane this year, it costs $40 to register, so it does cost some money, but you get to nominate anything for any category. So if there's web comics you like that you think deserve a Hugo, books, short stories, I believe uh, even musical pieces, but that is just a uh, guess. Larry would know better than I. Yeah, well, the, the, the whole idea, the whole idea was honestly just to get more people involved into the process, and so they can, uh, you know, nominate the things they love and the things they like that would normally get uh, ignored because they weren't from the proper channel. And you know, I just, I, I mean, it's not about me. I don't care if I ever ever get nominated again. It's that's kind of irrelevant. Um, the important thing is we get just all sorts of different people who would normally be ignored or shunned by the system. And get them out there. And so people can know that, you know, it's become kind of a joke. So this is award-winning, and to a lot of people, that was a sign to avoid it. Because award-winning meant preachy and bossy and obnoxious. We wanted to put the fun back in it, you know? We wanted exploding spaceships and, you know, laser guns. Let's, let's get some fun stuff in there. Let's make genre fiction cool again. And uh, so that was the whole, the whole kind of idea. And, this year we're going to push a whole bunch of different people and uh, who we uh, we think have produced really good works that would uh, normally get shunned, and so we're gonna we're gonna stick them out there for people to see. It it should be fun. So theoretically. <laughs> uh, a fun sequence. Just a, just an example. Okay, we've got a question for you. Um, okay, this is actually a good question. Should fantasy and science fiction authors use their work to convey? Messages. Well, yeah, you can, but here's the thing. It's it, my, my, what I say on that, and because I 
Hall Hoppers are going to have uh, themes that they want to explore. They're going to have a point they want to make. You know, we've all got our personal stuff that's going to come into our work, no matter what. That said, you got to put enjoyment and story first. You got you got story first, message fix second. The problem, what got me started on spun up on all this originally was I would be helping new writers, and they had to have this like hang up that oh I have to do this, I have to do this, and I have to check this box, and I have to check this box. Well, but that stuff made no sense for their story. It didn't make their story better; it made their story worse. But they felt like they had to do certain things to appease an angry mob, otherwise they were going to get attacked. And uh, you know that's putting that's putting your message first. Which then you know here's the thing: if you're not having fun as a writer, the reader's not going to have fun when they read it because it's kind of um, I mean, that comes through, like. Like, I have a reputation, I write these big action adventure things that people kind of blow through, you know, in a couple of days and they have a good time. This is because I have a good time. Um, and my enthusiasm is contagious to the reader. And uh, if you make writing a drudgery for, and I, I've, I've gotten hundreds of emails from authors of, um, from, you know, up doing really extremely well, top best-selling people, all the way down to brand new, just started out emailing me and thanking me for, hey, you know, thanks for thanks for doing this, thanks for provoking these people, thanks for arguing, because for a long time no one would actually argue with them, so it was just kind of accepted. Like, you have to do this, you have to do that. You have to insert these kind of characters, you have to have this kind of message. And that just, you know, that's preachy and bossy. <laughs> and readers don't like being yelled at. Um, readers are like gamers, and they don't like being told how to have fun. No one likes to be told they're having fun wrong. So uh, that's just kind of my personal uh, personal pet peeve, I guess. And so um, that's why we're that's why we started doing this. And it uh, kind of I just originally started out to make a point, and it kind of grew from there. And this year we've actually got a whole bunch of authors involved that I've not even been able to publicly uh, say who they are. But some pretty big famous authors are involved this year, and um, we're going to kind of try to shake it up a little bit. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I uh, I don't want to say anything else at this point because it's going to sound I'm going to sound sycophantic to say I I agree, but but I will say this: long before I had heard your name, uh, and yes, that it's true, it's sad. I'm sorry. Please don't be upset with me, fans of Larry in the chat. There was a time at which I had never heard of Larry. Um, so you're just going to have to forgive me for that. I, uh, hey, I'm, a, I'm a relative nobody in the grand scheme of things, so there's no shame in that. <laughs> um, before I heard your name, I had, uh, I was fed up, sick, and tired of politics and entertainment. I hated it. Um, just vile, vile obnoxiousness to put politics above everything else. Uh, it has been one of the most common pet peeves that I rant about, and my friends are, are kind of, uh, they've heard me on more than one occasion, and I, I try to tamp it down when I'm around people who know me because they have heard that before. I don't want to go on about it because I don't want to, I feel like I'm not doing this right. I feel like I'm not doing the, the podcast right. I'm not gushing enough. I'm not... Uh, <laughs> I, I think you're doing it right, uh, Warpig, but... I know you mean. I, I know you mean. Okay, so I play a lot of video games, and, uh, and it was kind of weird, because my kids, a lot of times when I'm playing, like, role-playing games, type video games, or big story games, my kids tend to, co you know, congregate in the living room, and they're all doing their own thing, but they're kind of watching the game, too, right? I mean, I've got, I've got four kids, and uh, we, we kind of have in our family running jokes about Bioware. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just because every now and then you'll be playing, and don't get me wrong, they're fun. I mean, I'm like, I'm 30 hours in uh, Dragon Age Inquisition right now, and but you get to a scene, and there just be some just completely asinine relationship thing, just preachy asinine relationship thing, and you know it's bad when you've got like a you know a 12 year old and a 14 year old, and they start laughing out loud <laughs> at it because of how how ham fisted it is, and you're just like, oh come on, Bioware. Give me a break, man. I just want to, I want to, I want to blow up monsters. <laughs> yeah, there, there's some, there's some pretty ham-fisted stuff stuck in there sometimes, but, <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's relatively innocuous compared to some of the things out there, but still, I mean, I'm with you. I, 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 I understand what you're saying. It, 
It drives me nuts, too. Um, we do have another question from Brian. Um, Brian Nehemiah, by the way, I, I have, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, fortunately, I've got a decent enough memory. Um, I want to break into Larry and take over the, the uh, show for just a second. Brian is a writer for Sci-Fi Magazine. Um, and he has been trying to get Larry on his podcast for a while, and there's been scheduling difficulties, and so he was excited, so excited for the show this week. He actually ran into Larry at Gen Con, and was going to... Uh, he was going to do a, a question and answer with Larry for his podcast, but they were both so exhausted from uh, the show, from all the things they'd been involved with at the con, that they just kind of collapsed and and laid there and talked a bit and did not have the energy to do an interview. So, of course, of course, of course, of course, I get Larry ready to do a cast with Brian, and the only thing he can do is type questions into the chat so that I can ask Larry, and Larry can tell you guys that's how... Well, uh, for, for Brian, I, I, I don't know how many of your, how many of your listeners have been to Gen Con. If, if you're a tabletop gamer at all, you owe it to yourself to go to Gen Con. I'm not going this year, but I've gone the last couple years in a row. I'm, I'm, I'm taking this year off. I'm going back in 2016. Gen Con is my favorite con to go to. Um, it is insane. It's just nuts. I bought, oh man, a thousand dollars worth of minis from <laughs> games last time. That's not a joke. I mean, I brought an empty duffel bag and filled it with minis to fly home. So I'm put it in a And then so you, you, you go to the con all day, and then you wind up in games all night, every night until like two o'clock in the morning. And then you get up the next morning and do it again. And, uh, you know, so you'll get in, like, I mean, I play War Machine. Uh, uh, you know, so, so you'll get in some games like that, pick up games with people, friendly games. A lot of guys look at tournament stuff. Or I wound up last time, like, doing, like, four different role-playing game sessions over, over like, two days. Um, like, <laughs> just, a, just a crazy fun con. And, uh, yeah, so by the end of it, uh, I don't remember what day it was I talked to Brian, but I, yeah, at the end of it, you're just kind of comatose. <laughs> it's right an awesome call, though. Absolutely love it. I, I have only been to Gen Con once, um, but it was the year the Violent Femmes came and played a street concert in between the two convention halls. So cool. I missed that one. Yeah, that was that, it was ninety seven. It was a long time ago, but it was a great convention. It really was. Um, yeah. Brian lets me know he has uh, he has all of the interview questions he was going to ask you at Gen Con in front of him right now. So <laughs> throw them at me. I'm I'm good to. He 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 wanted to ask this question. Um, what impact has geek culture had on your writing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it's kind of for me it's kind of inseparable, and uh, because I I'm just kind of a, I, I've always been into this stuff growing up. Uh, I mean, and so I guess it influenced me from storytelling perspective because I knew the kind of stories I like to hear, the story the kind of stories I like to participate in. So um, I shove that stuff into my books all the time. Uh, probably the most overt one I, I, would, I would like overt key influence was the Dead Chicks and Swords of Exodus, the main character that I'm writing is a fellow by the name of Lorenzo. And what it was is this book started out as a writing exercise where we were doing rapid fire, rough draft stuff being posted to the internet uh, with no proofreading, so there's no time to think. Every day you wrote another thousand words and stuck it up. It's kind of an experiment. Later it turned into a novel. It's pretty good. So I needed to come up with this character that was fully fleshed out with backstory, history, uh, quirks, personality, had to all be ready to go It just instantly. Um, and it was a kind of a spy thriller type novel, but I needed a, a kind of a character who was basically a kind of a rogue slash assassin. So I uh, I just went and uh, mentally grabbed a uh, role playing game character from a Forgotten Realms campaign that I had been in, and uh, who this, and his name was Ozzy. And so in the book, Lorenzo, this this thief, scumbag, assassin, is um, one of his co one of his many code names, one of his many aliases is Ozzy, and uh, <laughs> and so I just think I had the fully formed personality, the character, everything, 
And so when I wrote the book, I just made, I mean, it moved into the modern world, but it's straight up a role playing game character. And that turned into a series of novels, and we're working on the third and final one now. Uh, oh, jeez, what a, uh, in Monster Hunter, I got one of the, one of the characters in Monster Hunter paints minis and, uh, plays War Machine. I squeezed that in there. Uh, a little shout out to my peeps. But, uh, I don't know. I, 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 uh, Okay, so I write, I write books sometimes with Mike Cooper, and, and Mike's comment uh, about our writing styles is that he writes first uh, books that are basically first-person shooters, and I write <laughs> books that are basically role-playing games. I mean. <laughs> so, that, I don't know, yeah, I, I, I think the influence is just there. I, I took about 10 years off of gaming, because what happened as in you know, high school, college, all my 20s, I, I gamed a lot. But then, you know, I got married, I started having a career, I, you know, I worked for a uh, Fortune 500 company, and I was a finance guy, and then got into the gun business, I was a defense contractor, and uh, so for about a decade there, I didn't game at all, I was just, I was just too busy, career focused, and um, then I started writing, and I started having some success as writing, and I had my first book come out, and um, I was at a book signing one day with, uh, with Dan Wells. Who is uh, who's a great author? He writes uh, the the I Am Not a Serial Killer series and the Parcel series. Guy's fantastic author. And uh, so we're there at this book signing, and Dan's talking about his role playing games group, how they just had a guy move, and so they had a, they had a gap. And they needed somebody else. And he looks at me and goes, Hey, Larry, you ever play role playing games? He's like, Yeah. And I was like, Well, what kind of what kind are you playing? He goes, Legend of the Five Rings. I go, What was that? I've never heard of it. And uh, he's like. He's like, have you ever seen a Kira Kurosawa movie? So, okay, I am the biggest Kira Kurosawa Seven Samurai nerd, right? <laughs> so he tells me this, and uh, he's like, it's a role-playing game like that, only with magic and monsters. I was like, oh, crap, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and that was about, uh, I don't know, five years ago now. And uh, so that got me back into it, and so I've been doing it quite a bit, and... Uh, it, it's, uh, I got into mini painting um, a couple years ago because I needed a hobby that was not on the computer. I needed a hobby that was away from the computer because I was on the computer all day long writing books. So I needed something that took me away from the computer, but it was still something I could do at home. And you keep mind, it's frozen here half the year. So uh, I, I decided I was going to try mini painting, and I got addicted to mini painting, and I've been doing that pretty hardcore. And so as I'm talking to you, I'm walking around my office, I've got, um, let's see, a dozen shelves, that's not a joke, a dozen shelves filled with minis. And, uh, uh, I guess the first step to, uh, you know, on the 12 step things is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do have a mini painting addiction, but the mini painting and the role playing gaming and just gaming in general helps me as a writer because it helps me recharge my creative juices. And, uh, yeah, my role-playing game group over the last five years has been, you know, 90% of the time, it's all writers. Uh, it's all a bunch of novelists. And so we get very sub <laughs> We get very character-driven. And uh, it's funny, when someone says, like, a really awesome line that would be fantastic in a book, we all kind of eyeball each other to see who's going to steal it first. <laughs> I, I did that the other day online. Well, sometimes somebody says something, you're like, Oh man, that's good. Yep. You're in a book. <laughs> My, mine's going in a in a role playing game I'm writing, but yeah, somebody busted out a line that was absolutely perfect for the setting, and I and I had I went to them and said, "Can, can I use that?" Yeah, it's um uh, if you've read the Grim Noir Chronicles, there's uh, Toru. Um, Toru is kind of a kind of a more malicious version of the character that I played for the uh, L five R campaign. Okay. And uh, he was he was a fantastic character, right? You know, so yeah, I mean, you can't really separate the two when you're when you're a geek. It's going to come through in your in your artistic stuff. Um, can't really help. It. Oh, this is geek out ever, and I can actually announce this now. Speaking of geekery, um, you're, I'm guessing you guys are probably around my age. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm almost forty. I'll be forty years soon. Um, so you, I'm assuming you guys grew up with Larry Elmore stuff, right? You know, Larry yeah. Elmore. Okay, so everybody. Everybody around our age grew up on Larry Elmore art. The cover artist for my new fantasy series is Larry Elmore. Um, 
he, he came out of book retirement. He hasn't been doing book covers. He's just been doing original painting. Uh, he's come out of retirement to do the covers of this series, and he read the first book and he loved it. Awesome. So, yeah. So he's like, I'll do the covers. I'm like, holy crap, Larry Elmore's doing my covers? Dude, it was, it was a nerd moment. <laughs> it was I, like, I went all fanboy. I mean, I owned all five of the D&D colored boxes. Red, black, you know, blue. Uh, nice. All of them had Larry Elmore covers on them. Yep. Basic expert. Um, Companion, Master, Immortals. I, I owned all five of those when I was in high school, and every one of those, Larry Elmore. Uh, okay, was... you'll appreciate this. <laughs> I've got the uh, I've got the original Dragonlance, uh, the original three Dragonlance Chronicles novels. Oh, yeah. I, and I've got them I'm from 1985, my original copies from 1985, and I've got them now signed by Tracy Hickman, Margaret Weiss, and Larry Elmore. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> After a lot, you know, years now of going to cons, <laughs> I, I tracked down all these people and got their signatures in books I've had since I was 10 years old. Oh, man. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, no, you know, I, I, okay, Tracy, okay. Tracy Hickman is a wonderful guy. I actually, we're friends now. I know him pretty good. He's a wonderful guy. But um, the first time I met Tracy, Oh, man, I went total fanboy. Okay, so I played Dragonlance as a teenager. I read all the Dragonlance novels growing up, and they were probably the biggest influence of, like, my, you know, my, my teenage years as far as reading. I mean, cause I, I plowed through all those, and there's, you know, dozens and dozens of them at the time. And um, So the first time I met Larry or uh, Tracy, Monster Hunter had just come out, so I met him at a writing event. Oh, it wasn't even the it wasn't even the paperback. It was the original self published Monster Hunter, uh. and I had just gotten the the publishing contract for the Bainbird. So I met Tracy at an event, and I went up and I started shaking his hand. And I was like, "Oh, Mister Hickman, I'm so excited to meet you! I wrote a book." And apparently, according to the people that I was there with, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm six foot five, and you know, a huge, I'm a big big guy. Apparently, I, I like was scary as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I rush up to Tracy Hickman. I'm vigorously shaking his hand, and I like toss this book at him. And I'm like, I wrote a book here. <laughs> I mean, we're friends now. He's a great guy, and I've talked to him a bunch of times since. He's a wonderful man, but yeah, I guess I could be a little. Uh, I want a little fanboy. This, okay, I'm going to break in because this is this this actually has direct impact to, to that story, um, and I, I don't think I've told this story on the show or any of the shows before. So it is a similar moment. Um, the first time I met Larry, the uh, well, technically the only time I met Larry um, was at a gun range, um, which is the most Larry place to meet Larry. If you, that's a common place to find me. Um, and. I, I did not know that Larry was going to be there. I thought he might be there because I thought, you know, I was going to a gun range um, in an area where Larry was, and I thought he might be there. I didn't know for sure. I went there, uh, heard some people, went up to the range master where all the – there was two lines set up, one with pistols and civilian weapons, and the other one where they had set up all the cool military weapons, okay? And so I looked at the pistols and stuff, and I said, that's nice. I'm going to go for the gun. <laughs> Go for the cool-looking weapons. Um, and uh, seriously, it looks like one of those scenes out of, like, Call of Duty or whatever where they send you over and say, oh, hey, go get a gun from over there. And you have, like, 20 guns to pick from, all with different sights and different kinds of guns and different ammo. So I walk over to the cool place, and this tall dude is standing there with a, with a goatee. Um, and I... Uh, I say, hi, uh, I came over to shoot a gun, and, and the guy says, oh, yeah, my name's Larry. And I just kind of looked at him for a second. I don't know how long it was objectively. Subjectively, it didn't feel that long. And and, and then I asked, uh, and he holds out his hand. I shake his hand, and I say, uh, Larry Korea? <laughs> Larry cocks his head and says, kind of half hesitantly, Yes. <laughs> And then I started laughing, and I couldn't stop laughing for like 30 seconds. <laughs> so that's my story of meeting Larry. 
Well, if there's, if there's ever an event with machine guns or heavy weapons, I often got volunteered to be the guy to run run the people on the machine gun. Because I've been a firearms instructor for a long time. And so, I plus I, I know my way around full auto. And so I got that duty a lot. I don't even know which event this was. I honestly can't remember. There's been too many. But, uh, yeah, I've got a lot of... There's nothing quite as exhilarating as running complete strangers that you don't know anything about and uh, and, and how, how, how competent they are and giving them a machine gun. <laughs> oh, I must have been... Well, I don't know. I don't want to break this down to say I'm unlucky because they didn't have any machine guns that day, but they did have a 50 caliber Barrett. Um, oh, Barrett's a great... And I just... I couldn't believe that thing. I don't know, folks, if you've ever have a chance, if you ever, ever have a chance to stand near a Barrett while it's firing, you want to do that because I was like five, eight feet away from it, and when somebody shot it, it kicked up my pants. I mean, it literally sent my jean legs flapping. That was how awesome the uh, sniper rifle is. It just, and I got to shoot it. I got to shoot it. Larry was the range master, so he was the one who was like, okay, you want to get down, you want to do this with the... Um, and I just, it was awesome being able to shoot it. Um, so, yeah, that was no machine guns, but it did have a Barrett, so I can't complain. It, it yeah, would be ungentlemanly. That's, that's my other form of geekery, is, uh, is guns. I am a gun geek. I am a gun nerd. Uh, love them. I just have a lot of fun with them. And uh, talk about the, the muzzle blast on the Barrett, though. That's really fun for a while until you do it for 12 hours in a row. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, I say, I have had some headaches that you would not believe coming home <laughs> if they're running a 50 range. <laughs> um, yeah, I I can imagine. Speaking of which, um, this wasn't a question I was going to ask you. Brian has another question up in the queue, and I have to ask his question. But before I do, I want I want to ask this: Have you seen uh, American Sniper and or John Wick? No, I have not seen either yet. I'm always way behind on movies. Um, I want to see American Sniper. I've heard it's awesome. And I, you know, uh, uh, I mean, so I'm familiar with the story. Um, and plus, it really ticks off a lot of people that I don't like, like Michael Moore. So I'll probably just, I would buy tickets just for that. <laughs> but uh, I heard John Wick was awesome. I heard John Wick was actually a lot of fun. But I haven't seen it yet. Um, Absolutely incredible. Yeah, and... Uh, Dornall, who the audience can hear, but you can, it, yeah, said it was absolutely incredible. And it was. It was. It was a phenomenal action movie. It's the. I'm. I'm an action movie junkie. I see action movies as much as I possibly can arrange. Oh uh, yeah. And it is the. It is the single best action movie I've seen at least in a decade. Um, I, I. I was disappointed with Taken Three, not because of the plot or the characters or anything that happened, but because I wanted the fight scenes to be more like John Wick. That was my biggest disappointment with Taken Three. John Wick is weird. I'm going to go to the theater much, but I have a really big TV at home. Oh, yeah. It comes out. But yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for Wick. I heard that was actually good. Um, I did watch one clip of it. It was a scene where he goes into like a... He's coming out of a nightclub, I think. Oh, yeah. And he shoots like 16 dudes in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched it you know, hand-to-hand. and like, wow, that's... Keanu Reeves looks like a bad dude. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that makes Keanu awesome. Have you seen, okay, action movie nerd uh, stuff, have you seen The Man from Nowhere? No. Okay, it's a Korean movie. The first half is pretty slow. The second half picks up, and then it has the best knife fight scene in any movie ever made. Uh, it's, it, it was on Netflix. Don't know if it's still is, but watch that. Trust me. First half, then the second half, better than the best knife fight you will ever see. I, okay. I've watched this knife fight like 50 times. <laughs> uh, sorry, I've, I'm not responding because uh, I'm having to type with one hand and I'm, I'm writing that, I'm typing that up on my notepad so, <laughs> so I can remember it. Um, Doranal also wants to put in a word for the Raid Redemption because he thinks it's a phenomenal movie and... Oh, yeah. He made me... Oh, that's a good... That is a good movie. That is, uh... When the little... Okay, spoiler alert. When the little dude... When the little dude fights the two guys at the same time, at the 
the end, the little bad guy, he is so tough. <laughs> That is such a, that is a violent movie, too. Like, holy crap, that is a violent movie. That's coming from me. <laughs> he, he made me promise to watch this two years ago, and I haven't watched it yet. And every time it comes up, I have to feel guilty that I haven't watched a movie I promised to watch two years ago. <laughs> oh, man, yes. Yeah, it's, The Raid is, is fantastic. It's a, it starts out, you know, and it, it, it's guns. It, it, it starts out as a gunfight movie. You know, it's a SWAT team versus a bunch of bad guys. And it goes on, and it goes on. They start running out of guns. They start using, you know, knives and meat cleavers and bats and chains and choking people to death. And, and it just gets rougher and rougher and rougher. It's just, and then it never lets up. I mean, the movie never slows down. It, it's, it's, it's hyper-violent. Uh, from beginning to end. I, I liked it. I enjoyed the heck out of it. All right. So, uh, definite endorsement for The Raid Redemption if you haven't seen it. I'm going to ask Brian's question because I have been unfairly... Uh, well, actually, no, I haven't. You have been unfairly monopolizing the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I do that. Uh, Brian wanted to know, uh, loyalty to and protection of family is prominent in your work. Are there any real life influences that inform those themes? Oh, good question. Um, well, family is really important to me. I am a very family oriented man. I, I mean, I've been married for 17 years. Uh, I love my wife. Uh, I spend a lot of time teaching self defense to people. I've heard every horror story you can imagine. Um, every you know, criminal minds kind of psycho out there. I've you know, learned about, and I don't know, I, I, I'm very loyal and protective of my family. I grew up kind of rough, I grew up in a rough area, I grew up kind of poor, and we had, you know, we had a lot of family problems, but I, I mean, I still love my family, I still love my parents, and uh, they did the best they could with what they had, and uh, I don't know, family's always been a, that's, that's a hard one, that's a good question, I never really thought of it that way, but I suppose that is kind of a reoccurring theme with me. Um, it makes sense so from a writing perspective because you're telling a story and you want your readers to relate to it. And, you know, that, that connection. And all of that is not blood relatives in the story either. But, I mean, just that connection you get with your companions as you, as you go through difficult things in life. I mean, it's a powerful thing. I mean, it resonates with people. So, yeah, good question. But, unfortunately, I do not have a pat answer for it. I, and I'm... I'm... See, this is this is the moment at which I would I would ask him a question so he could clarify that, um, which is like what what sort of what sort of events or elements was he uh, was he thinking of in specific that would illuminate maybe what was behind it some more. I'm I'm going to do this. I'm going to break out a quick uh, anecdote and let him type that up so he can tell me so I can tell you what uh, what uh, events he was thinking of that would be family oriented. While I say this, because one of the things I think you skipped over. Ooh, I get to do this. This is so, so meaningful to me. You're, you're talking about, uh, Brian asked about geeky influences on your work. One of the things I noticed that you mentioned on your blog that you skipped over um, that went into uh, your, especially your first novels, was your love of bottom-of-the-barrel B-movie monster movies. <laughs> yep. Love it. Um... I'm a huge fan of, of horror movies, but not high budget horror movies, not slickly produced fancy ones. Honestly, those usually leave me cold. I, I'm not into them, but I love low budget horror flicks. I love monster movies. Um, just that part of my brain. <laughs> you know, if, if, if the movie cost a hundred million dollars to make, I'm very unforgiving as I watch it. I'm, I'm very critical. I'm very, especially about the writing and the plot, I'm very critical. But if the movie was made by a bunch of college students and the actors were paid in beer, and, uh, the, you know, the monster is a guy in, like, trash bags, I will forgive all manner of crap and just be joyous, you know, uh, and be happy as can be. I just, I enjoy, I, I'm passionate about uh, bad, bad movies. <laughs> I just love them. Um, I, uh, let's see, I had, uh, one time I was at a con, 
And uh, there was another guy there who was a uh, his, his his career Nathan Shoemate. He's kind of made a career on reviewing bad movies. And we had like a bad movie trivia contest. <laughs> we went back and forth, you know, uh, where we like we had questions from the audience to see who could name the various bad movies. And uh, I mean, back when I was in the gun business, they used to do that too. Like I like I'd be there working on something, and then. He, I had one time I was working with something, and there was uh, some Army Special Forces guys. This one guy looks at me, just out of nowhere, as we're working on like serious gun business, he just looks at me and goes, Korea, what movie had a zombie fight a shark? And I was like, oh, Lucio Fucci's uh, Zombie, t- I think it was Zombie 2, like 1978. And he looks at his phone, and he's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I've seen that movie. <laughs> yeah, just stuff like that. Um... Unfortunately, I've not keep enough. I've not kept up as well recently. So there's stuff in recent years that I've I've missed out on. But uh, uh, the '80s were a golden time. <laughs> um, the last 15 minutes of our last show uh, a week ago was all about uh, horror movies, bad horror movies, um, and and so one of Brian's friends is actually made. Um, a zombie, a Nazi zombie movie, because he had access to a place full of costumes. It's just exactly what you're talking about. College kids. Uh, it's called A Chance in Hell by Tony Wash. Um, college kids with a camera put together this uh, this zombie movie, shot it, and it's even in IMDb. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, had, uh, one time I was uh, we were talking about shooting events, and we had this guy show up and. Uh, uh, it was actually, it was related to night, and he's the, this guy's my size, big, intimidating fella, and we, uh, we start talking, and, and then he realizes who I am, because he reads my blog, and he goes, oh, so you love B-horror movies? I go, yeah, and he starts listing off the ones he's been in, um, because he helped produce a couple in, in Arizona, and it was so fun, because it was out of nowhere, it's like, all these other guys that are there, they're like, we had no idea what, what we're talking about, and, and it was, uh, Oh gosh, which one did he did? He did, uh, he did a few. What was that called? The um, oh, I'm, I'm I'm drawing blanks now on the name. It's been too many years. But it was just, it's always fun to run into people who they've read my stuff or I've like watched their stuff. Mm. I uh, I love that. I have a I have a I have an autographed um, framed copy of the the uh, of the movie poster for Zombie Strippers. <laughs> 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 um, you know, because you just you get the you know you get the mutual admiration thing where they're like they're a fan, you're a fan of theirs. Um, and it's just it's, it's fun, you know. It's uh, I, I I enjoy I, and I've met a lot of people that are filmmakers now for low budget stuff, and and I just I I, I appreciate their art. <laughs> I love those guys. Um, we have a question from the chat, uh, Mauser Seven Twelve wants to know if you can talk about the Bay and Fantasy Contest. Oh, yeah. Um, the Bay and Fantasy Contest, we started that uh, last year. It is going to be an annual thing uh, it, because we've had the Jim Bayon Memorial Science Fiction Short Story Contest for many years. Um, and this is now a fantasy one. I was, I was uh, one of the judges last year. I'll be a judge again this year. And how it works is it's, um, the details will be on the Bay and webpage. The uh, winners are announced at Gen Con, but basically it's you write a short story. Uh, it's got to be a fantasy short story. Um, you submit it to Bayon. Uh, basically, the award is publication. They buy it from you and they publish it. Uh, and they, they pay you professional rates and everything else. And it's a good resume builder, good practice. Um, it's just a fun contest. And the, the, the thing was, we, we wanted a big action adventure, fun, epic fantasy or heroic fantasy monsters and magic. You know, we wanted original things. We wanted, we wanted cool stuff. We didn't, we didn't want navel-gazing, lint-picking, you know, sitting around talking for hours kind of bullcrap. We wanted, you know, we wanted day in fantasy. And uh, we, we threw this out there, and we were thinking, okay, you know, this is the first year. We'll probably have, you know, 50 people enter. <laughs> I can't remember what the final number was. It was some ridiculous, like, 500 and something short stories came in. And uh, 
it was, I was so like we had this, uh, one guy in the office had been volunteered to be the alpha reader. He was the guy who was supposed to go through and narrow it down to the top ten. <laughs> um, and then he was going to give us the, the judges. And it was all blind. We didn't know anybody's names. We didn't know who wrote them. So we, went, we was blind judging. Um, and, so the, and then there was uh, five judges. And we would read the five. We actually went over 12, 12 finalists. And they were all good. Was the, was the problem? They were all twelve were, were good, solid stories, and so it was so hard. We wound up spending a couple days arguing. Um, the five judges actually wound up spending days arguing because no five of us, or none of the five of us, went all twelve in the same order. Um, but we we had some great, great stories. The winner was actually a short story um, by uh, Katie Juliter, which was um, called The Golden Knight. And it's just a really good, solid, well-written epic fantasy story. And um, it's part of a larger series, and they're now pitching... Last I heard, they were pitching a novel, uh, a full-length novel today. So, you know, it's a pretty cool contest, and uh, well, I'm looking forward to doing it again this year. All right. Um, I had a my own personal question. Is there any... Uh, are you planning on doing a... Uh, uh, an anthology of your short stories uh, at any point? Yes, we are. Um, that's kind of been back burner because I've been just cranking out books, but um, I, I now have quite a few short stories uh, published, and I have talked with my publisher about that, and so we will do a uh, we will do a collection of just my short stories. And we've also talked about doing a collection, an anthology of Monster Hunter International Universe stories by other authors, um, which is that's a separate anthology. So it'd just be like MHI stories um, by all sorts, you know, various authors who want to, who have been approached by many, believe me. And uh, that's two separate anthologies we've talked about. But um, yeah, I've actually done a lot of short stories over the last couple of years. Um, I don't know how many, but probably, probably got to be around 20 something, I'm guessing, but uh, over the last couple of years. But yeah, so I, I've got enough for a book. <laughs> Just, uh, yeah, so there will be. See, eventually. I'm, I'm just imagining now that you're talking about the Monster Hunter crossover series. I'm just imagining um, Butcher writing a story where uh, where Harry runs into Owen, and uh, I just... <laughs> okay, okay, so uh, I love Jim Butcher. Jim Butcher is an awesome writer, and he's a great person. I mean, he's, just a, he's a stud. He's a good dude, right, in person. Um, and I actually, you know, got to hang out with him at Gen Con this last year. And, um, uh, you know, hit it off with him. And uh, it's funny, okay, so this is a true story. One, uh, one day, um, it, okay, authors should not read their reviews online because it'll hurt your feelings. But, you know, I'm kind of a masochist. So I'm reading my reviews on Amazon for uh, the Monster Hunter series, and there's this one-star review. And the guy is just going off about how horrible and awful, bad, terrible, stupid, lame, <laughs> <laughs> going on, and just terrible review. And then he, then he ends with, and uh, if you want to read good urban fantasy, read Jim Butcher. Okay, that same day, that afternoon, Jim Butcher posts on Facebook and says, I just read this book called Monster Hunter International, and it was awesome. <laughs> Best orcs ever. <laughs> and he posted that to his fans. Okay, so you're never, ever supposed to post, this is before I met you, you're never, ever supposed to, like, respond when somebody gives you a negative review that's considered very unclassy. Yeah. Unless you have an opportunity like this and it's too dang funny <laughs> not to. So I responded, oh, really? We should read Jim Butcher? And then I quoted Jim Butcher and put the link, and I was like, "Fuck it!" <laughs> he thought it was awesome. <laughs> I had to do it because I mean, it was within 24 hours. You know, the, the club is like, I was like, "This is a sign that I'm supposed to mess with this guy on Amazon." <laughs> so Butcher's awesome. He's a good guy. We were on a we were on a panel together one time, uh, and uh, I can I can say that Jim Butcher has hit me with a cup of water. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on this panel. Oh, I've and, seen that. Uh, yeah, it was at Gen Con, and we're talking about um, magic systems and different kinds of magic <laughs> systems, and that's about technology mixing with magic and how does it work in your world, and we'd all go through an answer. And there's this guy on the panel, another author named Maurice Broad. Uh, and Maurice is a really nice guy, and he, he was kind of like an urban, like inner city 
kind of like King Arthur meets the wire, okay? And so, you know, great pitch. I haven't, I haven't read it, but I really heard the thing. So he's talking about how his guys wouldn't really have technology to fix the magic because they're poor and they don't really have access to high-tech stuff. I most have, like, cell phones. And he's like, what are they going to do, tweak their way out of trouble? And he says that. And I look at Marie's and I go, ooh, tweetomancy. <laughs> big fan of the Joe Ledger books uh, and oh, they're, they're excellent. the movie is in production right now they just cast uh, yep. a role I just read that yesterday oh I hadn't seen that yet oh, um, I, you know they did, a, they did a pilot several years ago for a, for a Joe Ledger TV show that didn't get off the ground but they did a pilot for it this is back before it got famous but Jeremy Renner was going to play Joe Ledger you know Hawkeye he's um, he's a uh, we talked about him last week too. He's a criminally undervalued actor. He is far better than his level of fame. Uh, he... Oh man, he could have been. I mean, he, could you imagine a Joe Ledger TV show starring that guy? That would be so cool. But uh, yeah, so no, I'm really excited. I'm really excited for. Him. I got a bunch of friends with stuff in production um, right now. That uh, and movie stuff. I've seen uh, like my. Like, mentioned Dan Wells earlier, but I think he's uh, they're going to start filming his I Am Not a Serial Killer movie uh, here pretty soon, which is going to be really cool. That's a good book. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always excited. We're, I mean, we're authors, most of us, most of us know each other, and we're actually pretty cool. <laughs> and so, we always kind of work for each other, but at the same time, there's that little bit of professional envy when somebody else gets like a really awesome deal that you didn't. Yeah. Um, so oh, this is a true story. Um, last year, a couple, the last couple of years, I've had um, uh, Monster Hunter International. I sold the rights to a uh, production company, and uh, you know they, they've been sitting on them and they haven't gone into production yet. So they have the rights, and but as the books got more famous, I started getting contacted by more and more Hollywood people who wanted to buy the rights so they could make a movie. Which is really cool when you're at home, just minding your own business, and you get a you get a phone call and somebody's like, "Hey, I'm a movie producer," and you're like, "Yeah, sure, you're a waiter." But then you put their name into IMDb while you're talking to them, and it comes up that they've like won Academy Awards and crap. <laughs> <laughs> that gets your attention real fast. Okay, so but I I get approached by different people, and I, I got approached by somebody is the guy that produced um, Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters, and he was working with The Rock, and The Rock likes Monster Hunter, and The Rock wanted to play Owen Pitt. Okay. Because he was, he wanted to play, um, he wanted an action adventure movie with monsters and guns and explosions and violence. He wanted a main character. Okay. He wanted a, he wanted like a Han Solo for himself. You know what I mean? So, uh, all I could do was send him along to the, the company that had the rights and uh, they made an offer, but they, the company didn't budge. And so that was, and then so, you know, that's Hollywood for you. And so yeah. nothing happened. And so then several months later, I'm, uh, I'm on Facebook. And I see an announcement from another author I know, a great author by the name of Weston Oaks. I 
fantastic horror author. And uh, I haven't read this book, but he's written a book called SEAL Team 666, where Navy SEALs fight monsters. And he announced that uh, he had just sold it to The Rock. <laughs> and he had already gone into production. And it was going to be starring Dwayne Johnson. And, <laughs> and I was like, oh, son of a gun. So I emailed Weston. You know, I know the guy. He's he like, a great dude. I email him. And I'm like, hey, first off, I saw that. Congratulations. That's wonderful for you. That's going to be great for your career. Second... I hate you! <laughs> Big, <laughs> angry screed, you know? I mean, I love the guy, that's, I'm glad he's got it, and, and uh, I'm happy for him, but it's one of those that's like he interviewed for the same job, and they didn't hire me, you know what I mean? So, it, so authors, we all kind of know each other, and run in the same circle, so you root for the other guy, but you're always a little jealous of, uh, of the awesome stuff that happens to somebody else. But, uh, Actually, that's some good news, though. Um, they extended, they actually uh, extended the contract, brought in some screenwriters. We're actually in production, um, last I heard. Um, but I don't know what's going to happen because Hollywood is weird and flaky. But they've actually proceeded. They've teamed up with Sky Network because um, uh, Rupert Murdoch, uh, his people came in, they were interested in it. So, you know, fingers crossed. We'll uh, hope for the best, but Hollywood's flaky, so I won't believe there's a Monster Hunter or TV show until I see the <laughs> All right. Um, we have about five minutes left in the show. Um, oh, man, that flew by. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, the time flew by for you because I spent, I'm, I'm estimating 20% of the show complaining about Google. So <laughs> you, 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 you didn't have to actually work as hard as you might normally have to on a podcast because um, I was upset. Um, let's see. I I want to do this because this is the last thing I wanted to talk about. I had a list of like four topics, one of which was anything that comes up. Uh, and obviously we've covered anything that comes up. Um, and the last of the topics I wanted to talk about uh, in the last couple of minutes is the uh, fantasy series that's coming out from Ban in October. Um, if you want to give a plug for that or just... Uh, because uh, I, actually, I loved the description of uh, of the main character because the way you described it was a cross between character A and character B. I thought that was awesome, and I want to give you a chance to, to tell that story. Yeah, the, my description of the main character would be a magical uh, cross between the Punisher and George Washington. Because uh, it's uh, the, uh, the the series covers a massive revolt. Um, and this guy is a no-nonsense murder machine um, <laughs> who kind of gets thrust into a position of leadership and importance as the series goes on. Um, okay, so basically what, how, 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 what the book is, uh, what the first book is, it's called, first book's called Sons of the Black Sword. Uh, it will be coming out in October. Uh, the sequel is called House of Assassins. And the third and final book in the trilogy is called Destroyer of Worlds. Uh, I don't have dates on those yet. That's the one Larry Elmore is doing the cover for. They are, uh, I'm pretty proud of them. It's a, uh, it's a world where um, there's a, they're basically isolated to one continent because there was a horrible event in the past where basically it rained demons, okay? Monsters fell from the sky to the earth, or not to the earth, but to the world, and um, almost eradicated humanity, and then a, kind of a legendary hero showed up, taught the people how to use magic. They drove the monsters back into the ocean. Ever since then, uh, the sea has basically been hell, and no one has ever crossed the ocean since. So they've uh, just been isolated to one continent. Um, and uh, the story takes place there. It's a civilization that has a really strict, brutal caste system, kind of kind of based on uh, uh, India's uh, system, where you have you know you have the caste left, the untouchables, and then and the warrior caste and the workers and the, and the management, basically the politician class, and. Um, the secular society of religion is completely illegal, completely banned, um, for reasons we get into the book. Um, this character, the main character, is a guy who's kind of a uh, elite, magical, roving law enforcement. Because the guy's basically a, a roving uh, killer of anybody who breaks law. And uh, then, so he does, and this guy burns villages. That's his job. So uh, <laughs> that's, my, that's my hero, <laughs> as the book goes on. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's pretty, ha pretty, ha pretty happy sunshiny. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, no, but it's good. It's, I'm really proud of it, and, uh, 
uh, it's coming really well. So uh, that that starts in October, and we're we're doing a pretty big push on it. We're doing a, a month long book tour for it. Uh, I'll be I, I'm not sure exactly where yet, but I will be all over the United States uh, for a month straight. So looking forward to it. All right, um, I'm gonna uh, pause real quick and uh, give. <laughs> <laughs> Give Dornall and Brian a chance to uh, to say whatever they uh, want to say. So I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself and let other people <laughs> use the mics. They've been sitting here in the chat, taking care of the audience and uh, feeding questions to me the whole whole show. I'm gonna hit mute real quick and let them say goodbye to everybody. Well, thanks for stopping by, folks. Thanks to Larry for coming. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, it's about the jury rigging we had to do. We had fun. Salt and vinegar chips, everybody. Salt and vinegar chips. Mm. Dead air. He must have broken the mute button. He's permanently muted now. I don't know who's going to close the show. Do you, do you want to try the yelling thing? Can, can one of us do that? Ah, we'll figure it out. In the words of Yako Warner, good night, everybody. All right, I'm back. I'm back. Thanks, sir. thanks for tuning in, folks. Uh, this is uh, Geek Gab once a week, Sunday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, one hour, all play, no work, with your hosts, Doran All, Brian Nehemiah. By the way, you can follow us all on Twitter. The links are down in the uh, description of the show. You can tune, uh, you can read me online uh, at daddywarpig.com, daddywarpig.com. Um, me and my co-hosts have very much enjoyed you guys showing up and listening to the uh, listen to the show with uh, Larry Correa, who is a great author, and uh, read us all on Twitter. We are signing off for tonight. We will be back.